From the CUBE studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a CUBE Conversation. Welcome to this CUBE Conversation. I'm Lisa Martin, pleased to be joined once again by the co-CEO of MemSQL, Raj Verma. Raj, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much, Lisa. Great to see you as always. Always great to see you as well. I always enjoy our conversations. So I wanted to start off because something that's been in the news the last couple of months besides COVID is one of your competitors, Snowflake, confidentially filed IPO documents with the SEC a couple of months ago. Just wanted to get your perspective on, from a market standpoint, what does that signify? Yeah, firstly, um, congratulations to the Snowflake team. Uh, you know, I've, I have a bunch of friends there. You know, John McMahon, my ex-boss, is on the board. And I remember having a conversation with him about seven years ago when it was just starting off. And I'm just so glad for him and Bob Moglai. And, and as I said, a bunch of my friends who are there, uh, they've executed brilliantly. And uh, I'm thrilled for them. So um, we are hearing as to what the outcomes are likely to be. And uh, it just seems like, uh, you know, it's going to be a great outcome. With, uh, and I think what it signifies is, firstly, if you have a great technology and if you execute well, good things happen and there's enough room for innovation here. So that is one. Uh, the second aspect is, I think, it, and I think more importantly, what it signifies is a change of guard in the database market. If you really see, um, and you know, if my memory serves me right, in the last two decades or probably two and a half decades, we just had one company go public in the database space, and that was Mongo. And uh, and that was in, I think, October 2017. And in uh, two and a half years or three years, we've seen another one. And uh, from the industry that we know, uh, you know, there are going to be a couple that are going to go out in the next 18 months to 24 months as well. So the fact is that we had a, a iron grip on the database market for almost, you know, more than two decades. It was Oracle, IBM a little bit of Sybase and SAP HANA. And now there are a bunch of companies which are helping solve the problems of tomorrow with the technology of tomorrow. And, uh, and that, is, uh, that is Snowflake is a primary example of that. Um, so that's, uh, that's good, change of guard is good. I do think the incumbents are gonna find it harder and harder going forward. And also if you really see the evolution of the database market, the first sort of workloads that moved to the cloud were the developer workloads, and the big benefactor of that was the NoSQL movement. And one company that executed, in my opinion, the best uh, was Mongo, and they were the big benefactor of that, that sort of uh, movement to the cloud. The second was the very large but noisy database, uh, data warehouse market. And a big benefactor of that has been Snowflake. Uh, BigQuery is the other one as well. Uh, however, the biggest sort of tsunami of data that's we are seeing move to the cloud is the operational data, which is the marriage of historical data with real-time data to give you real-time insights, or what we call the now. Uh, now, and and that's going to be much much bigger than uh, than both the the NoSQL or the developer data movement and the data warehouse movement, and we hope to be a, a benefactor of that. And with the shakeup that happens in the database market and with the change of guard that's happening. There isn't a winner-take-all market uh, anymore, and that's good because you don't then have the stranglehold that Oracle had, and you know some of the ways that it treated its customers and held them to ransom, etc. Um, yeah, you know, giving customers choice so that they can choose what's best for the business is going to be it's going to be great, and we are going to see seven to ten really good database companies emerge in the next decade, and we. Uh, surely hope MemSQL is one of them. We definitely have the have the potential to be one of them. We have the market, we have the product, we have the customers. So, you know, as I tell my team, it's up to us as to what we make of it. And, uh, you know, we don't worry that much about competition. You did mention Snowflake being a competition. We, yeah, sure, you know, we do compete on certain opportunities. However, their value proposition is um, a little more single-threaded than ours. So they're more in the data warehouse space. Uh, our our vision of the world is that uh, you know you should have a single store for data, whether it's data warehouse, whether it's developer data, or whether it's operational data or OLTP data, and uh, you know watch this space for more as we make some very exciting announcements. So dig into that a little bit more because some of the the news and the commentary, Raj, in the last maybe six weeks since uh, the Snowflake um, IPO confidential 
information was released was, is the enterprise data warehouse dead? And you just said a couple of interesting things. We're talking about now, we're seeing this momentum, huge second database to go public in two and a half decades. That's huge, but that's also signifying to a point you made earlier, there's, there's a shift. So MemSQL is it, we're not talking about an EDW, we're talking about operational real time. How do you see that? If you're not looking in, in the rear view mirror at those competitors, how do you see that market and the opportunities? Yeah, I, I, I don't think the data warehouse market is dead at all. I think the very fact that, you know, Snowflake is going out at whatever valuations they go out, which is, you know, tens of billions of dollars is, um, is a testimony to the fact that, you know, it's a fancy and mousetrap, right? Which is what it is. I mean, data warehouses have existed for decades, and uh, there is a better way of doing it. So it's a fancier mousetrap, and and that's great. I mean, that's way to make money, and it's clearly being demonstrated. Now, what we are saying is that I think there is a better way to manage a organization's data rather than having them categorized um, in in buckets of you know data warehouse data, developer data, OLTP or transactional data, and, you know, um, analytical data. Is there a way to imagine the future where there is one single database that you can query for data warehouse workloads, for operational workloads, for OLTP workloads, and gain insights? And that's not a fancier mousetrap. That is a data strategy reimagined. And, uh, and that's our mission. That's uh, our purpose in life uh, right now. And uh, we are very excited about it. It's going to be hard. Uh, it's not. It's not a given, it's a hard problem to solve, otherwise it would have been solved before. Uh, we, have the, uh, we have the goods to deliver and the talent to deliver it, and uh, we, are, we are trying it out with some very, very marquee customers, so we feel very excited about it. Well, changing of the guard, as you mentioned earlier, is hard. The opposite is easy. The opposite, you know, ignoring and, and not wanting to get out of that comfort zone, that's taken the easy route, in my opinion. So it seems like we've got in the market this this significant changing of the guard, not just in you know what your, some of your competition is doing, but also from a, a customer's perspective. How do you help customers, especially institutions that have been around for decades and decades and decades, pivot quickly so that the changing of the guard doesn't wipe them out? Yeah, um, I, I actually think slightly differently. I think changing of the guard, um, wiping out uh, a customer is if they stick or are resistant to the fact that there is a change of guard, you know. And if they if they hold on to, as we said in our previous conversation, if you stick on to the decisions of yesterday, you will not see the sunrise of tomorrow. So I do think that, uh, you know, changing of the guard is a is a symbolism, not even a symbolism, is a statement to our customers to say, there is a better way of doing uh, what you are doing to solve tomorrow's problem. It then doesn't have to be the oracles and the DB2s and the Sybases of the world. Uh, so that's that, that's one aspect of it. And the second thing is, as I've always said, we are not really that obsessed about uh, competition. The competition will do what they do. Uh, we are really very focused on having an impact in the shortest period of time uh, on our customers and uh, hopefully a positive impact. And if you can't do it, then, you know, I've had conversations with a few of them saying, maybe we are not the company for you. Uh, it's not as if I have two sort of softwares, the good one I supply to the successful customers and the bad to the to the unsuccessful customers. Uh, the fact is that, you know, in certain certain places, there isn't an organizational alignment and you don't succeed. However, we do, uh, again, we have in the last 14 months or so made tremendous investments into really ease of use, uh, flexibility of architecture, which is hybrid and multi-cloud, and uh, shrinking the total time to value for our customers. Because if I, if I believe you, if you do these three things, you will have an impact, a positive impact on the customer in the shortest uh, amount of time, and you'll endear yourself. And I think that is more important than worrying needlessly about competition. I mean, the competition will do what they do. But if you keep your customers happy by having a positive impact, um, success is only a matter of time. And customers and employees are essential to that. But I like that you talked about customer obsession because you see it all over the place. Many people use it as descriptors of themselves in their LinkedIn profiles, for example. But for it actually to be meaningful, you talked about the whole objective is to make an impact. 
for your customers. How do you define that so that it's not just, I don't, I don't want to say marketing term, but something that, oh, everyone says they're customer obsessed. Showing it, right? Poop in the pudding. It's easy to say we are customer obsessed. I mean, which it's, organization is going to say we don't care about our customers. So, you know, of course, we, we all want our customers to be successful. How do you, that's easy. You know, having a cultural value that we put our customers first is uh, was easy, but we, we didn't choose to do that. What we said is, how do you have an impact on your customer in the shortest amount of time? Right? That is that is a virtue of MemSQL. And we have now designed every process in MemSQL to align with that virtue. If, if there is a decision that we have to make, um, we essentially lens it through the fact of what is in the best interest of our customer and what will get us to have an impact, a positive impact on the customer in the shortest amount of time. That is the decision, which is the right decision for us to make. A lot of times it's more expensive. It's a, a lot tougher. It stresses the, um, the, the, the organization um, and the people in it. But that's, uh, that's what you have to do if you are um, if you are, you know, as, as they say, customer obsessed. Um, it, is, it is a term which is easy to use, but very difficult to adhere to. And we want to be authentic about it, right? We, we are going to continue to learn. It's, a, it's not a destination, it's a journey. And we continue to take decisions um, and refine our processes to, as I said, have impact on our customers in the shortest amount of time. Now, Obsessiveness, uh, a lot of times, is seen as a negative in, in, you know, in the current society that we um, live in. And, and there's a reason for that, because the way we view obsession, or I view obsession and aggression, is there is a punishing aggression, which is really akin to just being cruel, you know, leading by fear and all the rest of it, which is, has no place in any organization. And I actually think uh, in society at large, not think, I believe, uh, doesn't have any place in society at large. And then there is something which I term as instrumental aggression, which is, this is where we were, this is where we are, this is where we are going, and how do we track our progress on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? And if we aren't sort of getting to that level that we believe we should get to, if our customers aren't seeing the value from us in the shortest amount of time, what is it that we need to do better? Um, is that obsession or instrumental aggression is, uh, is, is what we are all about. Uh, and that brings with it a level of intensity, which is not for everyone. But then when you are you know, challenging the institutions which have uh, you know, ruled the rules, so as to speak, for decades, it's going to take a Herculean effort to oust them. And uh, you know, we, we basically believe that instrumental aggression, intensity, uh, you know, having an impact on customer in the shortest amount of time is going to get us there. And, uh, and we are glad to have people who actually believe in that. And, uh, and that's why we have made tremendous progress uh, in, uh, over the course of the last uh, a few years. So instrumental aggression, interesting how you talked about that. It's a provocative statement, but the way that you talk about it almost seems it's a prescriptive, very strategic, well thought out type of moving the business forward busting through the old guard because let's face it you know the big guys the oracles they're there they're not easy for customers to rip and replace but instrumental aggression seems to kind of go hand in hand with the changing of the guard you've got to embrace one to be able to deliver the other right yes it does i i think even if you were inventing something new uh, i mean yeah it, it, it just requires instrumental aggression i believe is a uh anchor or core to most successful organizations, whether in IT or anywhere else. There is a there is a side to that obsession, and not I'm not talking about instrumental aggression here, but I'm really talking about the obsession to succeed, which uh, you know gave rise to what I think someone called as brilliant jerks and all the rest of it, because that is the sort of the negative side of uh, of obsession. And I think uh, the challenge of leadership in our times is how do you foster the positivity of obsession, which leads to change of thought, and, and that's the instrumental aggression as a, as a tool to, to go there. And how do you prevent the negative side of it, which says that the end justifies the means? And, uh, and that's just not true. 
there is there is something that's right and there's something that's wrong. And um, and if that is made very clear that the end does not justify the means, it creates a lot of trust between. Um, us and our customers, us and our employees. And when their inherent trust uh, happens, then you, you foster, as I said, the positive side of obsession and uh, get away from the negative side of obsession that we've seen in certain you know, very, very large companies. Now, the one thing that instrumental aggression and obsession brings to a company is that uh, it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. And this is what I continue to tell um, our, our employees and my colleagues is, um, you know, be comfortable being uncomfortable because what we are trying to do is hard. And uh, it's going to take, a, as I say, a Herculean effort. So let's, uh, let's be comfortable being uncomfortable and, uh, and have fun doing it because uh, how many people get a chance uh, to change uh, industry, which is dominated by a few players and have such a positive impact, not only on our customers, but society at large. And uh, I think it's a privilege. Pressure is a privilege. And uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity that's been afforded to me and to, uh, to my colleagues. And uh, that's a we... great way. Sorry, that's a great way of looking at it. Pressure is a privilege. If you think about, I, I like what you said, I always say, get, you know, get comfortably uncomfortable. It is a hard, in any aspect, whether it's your workouts or your discipline, you know, working from home, it's a hard thing to do. To your point, there's a lot of positivity that can come from it. If we think of what's happening this week alone and the U.S. political climate, changing of the old guard, we've got Kamala Harris as our first female VP uh, nominee in how many years, but also from a diversity angle, from a, a women leadership perspective, blowing the door wide open. It's great uh, to see that, uh, you know, we have someone that my daughters can look up to and say that, uh, you know, yes, there is there is a place for us in society and we can have a meaningful contribution to society. So I, I actually think that Senator Harris's nomination is, uh, you know, is a symbolism of change of God for sure. Um, I have no political agendas here um, at all and we'll see how it pans out in November. But the one thing is for sure that it's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable. A change of God always makes a lot of people uncomfortable. And, um, and, you know, I was reflecting back on something else and you know, everything that I've actually achieved, which is, which is something I'm proud of, I had to go through a zone that I was extremely uncomfortable. Um, growth only happens when you're uncomfortable. Uh, growth never happens in your comfort zone. Uh, now, whether it's, um, you know, running MemSQL uh, or, or having a society or change, uh, if you stick to your comfort zone, you stick to your prejudices and biases because it's just comfortable. There is a... A, a, a warmth and mediocrity, and uh, and and I think that, that that essential change of God, as I said at the cost of repeating myself, will make a lot of people uncomfortable. But I, I honestly believe will will move uh, the society forward. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm I couldn't be more proud of uh, of having uh, a California senator being nominated and. Uh, it's, uh, she brings diversity, multicultural, and, and what I loved about it was, you know, we talk about culture and all the rest of it, and she she was talking about how her parents, who were both uh, uh, at Berkeley when she was growing up, would put her in a pram, or whatever they call it here, I think, stole her, or what have you, and she'd be, you know, in her in her pram going to uh, protests and rallies and. So it was just, uh, it was ingrained in her to be able to challenge the status quo and move the society forward. And, uh, you know, she was comfortable being uncomfortable when she was in a plan, you know. And, uh, and, and that's good, you know. I think we, we sort of, uh, yeah, I, yeah, let's see, let's see what November brings to us. But uh, I, I think just a nomination has, uh, has changed a lot of things. And, uh, if it's not this time, it will be the next time or the time after that. But we will have a woman vice, a woman president in my lifetime. Uh, that's that I'm convinced about, and uh, and that's just great. Uh, well, I should hope so too. And I, there's so many. I know we've got to wrap here, but so many different data points that show that that technology company, actually companies, excuse me, with women in leadership position are significantly 10, 20 percent more profitable. 
So the changing of the guard is hard, as you said, but it's time to get uncomfortable. And this is a great example of that, as well as the culture that you have at MemSQL, Raj. It's always a pleasure and a philosophical time talking with you. I thank you for joining me on theCUBE today. Thank you, Misa, it's always a pleasure. Stay safe and well. You as well. For my guest, Raj Verma, I'm Lisa Martin. Thank you for watching this CUBE conversation.